I'm Tom Pappard for The Honest Media. Thank you for tuning in. The Honest Media is my effort to bring honesty back to journalism and not by adopting the stale, non-existent lack of bias people are taught to hold in school. We live in a media world where every media personality has a clear bias. People claim they're journalists when they're really commentators. So yes, I'm a commentator, but I'm never going to spew something I know to be untrue. And though I do enjoy engaging in gossip as much as the next person, anytime I make a claim, I'll cite it with a fact. And I invite anybody to do research and prove me wrong. You can contact me on Facebook, Twitter, or my website, thehonestmedia.com. In this episode, we have some fascinating topics. I'll show you some of the cultural phenomena this election has created. Then I have an interview with an Ohio activist who will tell us what it's like in the contentious battleground state. Later, Craig and I discuss the very real possibility of an Obama-Clinton-led entrance to World War III with Russia. We also discuss the stunning revelation that Obama knew all about Hillary's crooked bathroom email server. There's an email from the Podesta leak saying they need to clean up the fallout of Obama saying he learned about Clinton's bathroom server on the news. You know, I've often said this campaign is the world's best reality TV show and it just becomes more true daily. Because if Obama really knew, then there is evidence the entire executive branch of the government knew and is implicated in this flagrantly illegal action. And yes, Hillary Clinton will tell you, well, the FBI said it was fine. But if you break it down, that's really not true. And I'm only an amateur, but Comey used language conspicuously similar to criminally negligent, all while maintaining he was not going to recommend action. And of course, later we learned Comey has been involved with the Clinton Foundation in his own convoluted way, but that's not important. It's truly a fascinating story, and next to nobody wants to talk about it, sort of like this World War III thing. Russia is preparing for war. They're stockpiling food and resources in their largest cities, telling their government workers who have families living abroad to come home immediately, and warning the United States they do not know where diplomatic relations will go from here. There are massive U.S. and Russian fleets making moves that haven't been seen since the Second World War. And meanwhile, you have Hillary Clinton, who said we should go to war with any country we even think may have launched a cyber attack against the United States. And while there is still no concrete evidence Russia is behind the WikiLeaks hack, and WikiLeaks itself denies any involvement with Russia, or any state for that matter, and even though liberals and specifically Democrats used to love WikiLeaks when they were revealing some of the worst parts of President George W. Bush's administration, the media will not let this false idea that Russia and Donald Trump are somehow funding WikiLeaks die. In short, this means Hillary is calling for war with Russia, directly. Not only this, she's leaving open a very dangerous precedent. Say you're some horrible cyber terrorist and you want to start World War III. Well, all you have to do is hack some government agency in the United States and make it look like it was done by the Russians. According to Hillary Clinton, the mere appearance of a government hacking you, just the idea or the suspicion, is enough to go to war. And the media wants to tell us about what Trump might have done on an airplane 35 years ago. This is the state of affairs today. And I have to give credit, I'm pulling this next argument right from Stefan Molyneux of Free Domain Radio. The United States is out of money. Hillary Clinton and the left love to deny the truth, but the U.S. is out of money, and we're almost to Greece level of debt, with a deficit that nobody can even comprehend. And when governments are out of money, they have a few options. They can wake up one day and say, sorry folks, we're not paying. You knew it was too good to be true, now you know for sure. Sorry China, not paying. Sorry Social Security recipients, not paying. Sorry welfare recipients, we don't have the money. And if you don't have the money, you can't pay. This is probably the least damaging way to unload this insurmountable debt that you can imagine what it would do to an organization's trustworthiness. Now another option is governments can monetize the debt. This is when you print tons and tons of money. Or in 2015, 16, I guess you just add tons of money to the bank using a computer. And this sounds like a good idea on the surface, except for the Zimbabwe or Weimar Republic style inflation it brings. This is the sort of action that results in people bringing wheelbarrows full of cash to the bakery to buy bread. Money becomes worthless, destroying what little savings the middle and lower classes have left. And the third way governments can get out of debt, generally speaking, historically speaking, is military conflict. 
It's a lot easier to default on your debt if you have a good reason. It's also a lot easier to convince your population to accept the idea their welfare checks or even their social security checks aren't coming anymore if they can see why. If we're losing hundreds of thousands of lives, as I think we will, fighting Russia and China in a massive global conflict, people are going to be less concerned about their entitlements and more concerned with whether or not they're about to die in a nuclear holocaust. And it certainly seems like we know which direction Hillary Clinton is going. Even in the Podesta leaks, it's clear the campaign knows this, or something like it, is coming. When a pollster wrote to John Podesta about the Iran deal, saying it, quote, condemns the next generation to cleaning up a nuclear war in the Persian Gulf, Podesta replied with, yep. So will the Obama-Clinton foreign policy doctrine lead to a nuclear war that could very well extinguish the glimmering light of Western civilization once and for all? Well, I'm no expert, but in Podesta's words, yep. I'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to The Honest Media. Coming up next, I'll have an interview with an activist from Ohio who's going to give us a perspective of what's happening in the battleground state. He's been interviewed by PBS, Fox Business, and other mainstream media outlets, and I think he does a really great job at offering a look at what's happening on the ground in a battleground state. But first, this is going to be kind of a serious episode, so I want to take a break and look at two amazing things that have come up in this election cycle. The first is Martin Shkreli, the pharma bro, as you may know him. Hate him or love him, respect him or reject him, I find Shkreli hilarious, and I have ever since I discovered his Twitter account. And I can only describe his Twitter banter and real-life trolling as Trump-esque. Shkreli became famous after he raised the price of an AIDS med medication. And Shkreli says it was to increase research on the drug and make it better, and says he was going to work with anyone who couldn't afford it. His critics say he was price gouging and hurting a population dependent on the drug to survive. But again, regardless of what you think of him, he's a hilarious person. This is a man who looked utterly bored out of his mind when he had to speak in front of Congress. And later he said his only regret was not bringing his Nintendo DS. When Shkreli began toying with the idea of buying 4chan, posters on the website joked, the most hated man in America, buying the most hated website in America. What could go wrong? When Hillary Clinton collapsed on the anniversary of the Benghazi terrorist attack, Shkreli went to Chelsea's apartment where Hillary was hiding out and yelled, Why are you so sick? And, Go Trump! Later tweeting, Get well soon, bae. So why is he back in the spotlight? Well, he considers himself a collector, a private collector of music, and recently he bought the only copy of a secret Wu-Tang Clan album. He also claims to own never-before-heard never before content from the Beatles and Nirvana. And he says if Trump wins, he's releasing his entire private library to the public for free. And before you ask if 2016 can get any crazier, I want to introduce you to Malik Obama. Malik is President Obama's older brother, half-brother. He's on Twitter and he supports Donald Trump. And his tweets are absolute gems that make me laugh until I cry. Regarding his battle to become a verified account on Twitter, if it is racist to require ID to vote, is it racist to require a black Kenyan man to use his ID to be verified? Reporters lie and they say I am not real, so I give them my phone number and post selfies. Do they want my birth certificate? Okay. I am really Malik Obama. Twitter will not verify me, and I did send them my birth certificate and passport photo. On culture. I understand Pepe and Arambe now. Thank you, friends. On illegal immigration, I will help Trump deport the illegal. And on Donald Trump, Donald Trump is not 70. He is a lion. The man's tweets are just pure gold. They keep me laughing and smiling when I should be sleeping or working. Now I'll be right back with our activists from Ohio.
Welcome to The Honest Media. I'm Tom Papper here with Daniel E. Moore via Skype. And Daniel is an Ohio resident. He considers himself a swing voter. He works for a Russian-owned steel company. He's a union member. And yes, in come the Putin-Soviet spy jokes, but we'll let them slide anyway. He's a Catholic, and he's a Cold War Air Force veteran. Daniel, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Tom, for having me on your show today. And I look forward to... Um sharing my views with you and uh, and to uh, talking with your with your uh, audience here in Wichita, Kansas. And uh, I love I love Wichita. And and when it, when when I first uh, when we first made a connection, uh, I the first the first thing that came to my mind was Glenn Campbell and uh, and the very famous song uh, Wichita Lineman. And uh, and so yeah, I, I love what you're doing out there, and, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be uh, talking with you. Well, I know my viewers will appreciate that. So, some quick history on Ohio for those maybe who are just getting involved this election. It's, of course, a battleground state. Last time around, it went for Obama, but only by a little under 2%. It was 50.1% Obama, 48.2% Romney. And then, of course, you live in Trumbull County, which is a little bit bluer. But I wonder if you can tell us, how have things changed in four years? Well, over, over the past four years, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, uh, amongst my family and uh, neighbors and uh, co-workers, uh, because I'm a, uh, a, a political activist, uh, people come and they tell me things. And uh, what I've been hearing is, is, a, is a growing sense of, uh, of, of anger, frustration, uh, anxiety, and, and concern. Uh, uh, amongst the majority of people that I talk with who still believe uh, America is going in the wrong direction, e even after uh, eight years of an Obama presidency. When you were telling me before we started recording that in, both in 2008 and in 2012, you actually went for Obama both times. Can you tell us a little bit about what took you from Obama far left to Trump, who is, some would say, on the far right? Well, um, at that time, uh, in, in 2008, um, you know, uh, we, America had, had just, the American people had, had just uh, gone through eight years of a Bush presidency in, in a, a disastrous uh, uh, war in Iraq, which uh, didn't exactly uh, turn out to be a major success. And so I, I think people were, were hungry for change. And uh, when President Obama stepped on the stage, as, and presented himself as an articulate, uh, intelligent, uh, young, uh, a, a black uh, community organizer from Illinois. Um, you know, people were, were naturally enthusiastic in, in high hopes uh, uh, for Mr. Obama. And so I was right there with him. Uh, the United Steelworkers uh, endorsed him. My wife, Lisa, and I uh, did a lot of door-to-door -door campaigning here in Newton Falls. And, and so, um, you know, they, and I, I was really hoping, uh, really hoping to, to see uh, him uh, follow through on, 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 you know, all of his campaign promises. And, but uh, that, that, didn't turn out to be the case. There's, uh, as like over the uh, eight years of his presidency, there's 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 just been a lot of disappointment, and uh, that's no disrespect to uh, President Obama because, uh, you know, I have I have uh, ancestors who are who are Cherokee, so I'm certainly I'm certainly not a racist. You know, uh, I'm a, I'm a very compassionate humanitarian, and uh, but uh, you know. This it's the uh, a lot of concern about the the future of our country and and what our children and grandchildren are going to inherit. Well, and of course, there's the old saying. I believe it was Thomas Sowell who said, uh, "Well, what's a racist? Well, a racist is a Republican who just won an argument against a Democrat." So I wonder if you can tell us, you know, jobs. I think what you're alluding to is jobs. What's the job situation like in Ohio? <sighs> I, I know the uh, there's a lot of people who are are, are minimum wage workers. There's a lot of people who are, are, are working part time. 
There's a lot of people who are working uh, two jobs uh, to try to make ends meet. Uh, there is a lot of a lot of uncertainty within the uh, manufacturing uh, industrial base. Okay, which which, as many people know who've studied the issue, has been in a steady state of decline uh, over the over the past few decades. You know, especially you know here in Northeast Ohio and uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan, uh, the Rust Belt uh, states and uh, brownfields, with which have lost. Uh, a really significant uh, amount of uh, high-paying manufacturing jobs, including uh, in the steel industry. So I discovered you in part because you were on PBS NewsHour. They were doing a feature on the ground situation there in Ohio, what people are actually doing, what it's actually like, and they did an amazing profile on your family. You know, What's it like to be kind of voiced into the national, and I think you were telling me even international, conversation? Oh, it's 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 a really it's a really great honor and a privilege uh, for uh, you know uh, because I think you know it's it's it, and I have a lot of great respect uh, for for the news media and uh, and the and an opportunity to for for ordinary uh, blue collar guys like myself you know to uh, to be able to uh, voice their opinions uh, on a national and international audience so. I really appreciate those opportunities, and uh, and hopefully uh, I can, uh, you know, by doing so, uh, make a positive contribution and uh, and to really uh, give uh, you know our, our American electorate and voters, uh, you know, something to uh, to think about before they uh, uh, cast a ballot on November eighth, twenty sixteen. speak for myself, but it's always wonderful to talk to regular people. You know, I can talk to pundits, I've had people from the Trump campaign on, but what people really want to see are people like yourself giving their perspective, so I appreciate having you on. I, I wonder, a lot of people, I know even PBS made this argument, you, you worked in factories, you know what it's like to do manufacturing, so what do you think of NAFTA and these quote-unquote free trade deals? Well, one thing that I know about NAFTA, even though I'm not an expert, because of being in the steel industry and uh, you know, getting a lot of very factual uh, information from the uh, USW leadership in Pittsburgh, uh, history has proven that NAFTA was a very bad, very bad trade agreement uh, for the U.S. economy, uh, for working class families, and uh, and and uh, did a, did a, uh, it, you know. Uh, so, as you know, signed by uh, former President uh, Bill Clinton, it, it was supposed to bring 200,000 200, plus, uh, uh, you, you know, high-paying manufacturing jobs. And, and the uh, the result uh, years later was that the U.S. economy lost uh, close to a million uh, high-paying manufacturing jobs, and, and 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 at least a dozen states and communities. Uh, that, that were then families that, that were devastated uh, by, by this agreement. You know, even though it was so many years ago, uh, a lot of the factories that, that these communities lost, uh, they're still mothballed and, and probably not coming back, you know. And, and a lot of the cities, uh, including, uh, you know, uh, Youngstown and, and Warren, Ohio, uh, when you lose a major em employer, like that, all of a sudden, the city government is scrambling, uh, and the city officials saying, "Where are we? How are we going to replace that uh, lost tax revenue?" Well, so. of course, I think we in Wichita, and of course, the show has a national audience as well as a great audience here in Kansas. We know that sting. We've lost aircraft plants sometimes to other states, but sometimes to China, and we have to kind of wonder why are we letting China build our airplanes? But, And I think you're absolutely right. It leaves people wondering, well, where are we going to work? These jobs may not have been glamorous according to some definitions, but they were jobs and they were good jobs. I wonder, 
if you can tell us just a little bit about what you think is going to happen. What's the enthusiasm like for Trump? Are they coming out? Is it still divided 50-50? How do you see Ohio going when it comes November 8th? Uh, per personally, uh, I think I think uh, Ohio uh, is 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 leaning towards Trump, and and I would certainly do everything possible to make sure that Ohio is in in, in the Donald Trump's column, be, because of the uh, serious issues that we're facing as a country. Uh, we can't not keep uh, hemorrhaging uh, and losing high-paying manufacturing jobs. Uh, the, the U.S. middle class is, is being, has been under assault from these so-called uh, free trade agreements. Uh, and uh, I honestly believe that if Donald Trump would have been president uh, back back in the day when, you know, as, as many people know, he was considering running for, for a number of years now, that he would have not have signed NAFTA. He would not have done it. Because uh, I don't think, and I don't see personally how any president of the United States could sign a trade agreement that, that hurts American working class families and that hurts US, the U.S. economy. I, I, it, just, it, it seems to me like it uh, defies common sense and, and reasoning and is kind of a, like a, uh, a form of self-destruction. The, the U.S. economy and the middle class are, are a very important part of the larger global economy. And when we don't have a strong middle class that, that's, uh, that's growing and thriving, um, our country and our government looks weak in, in the eyes of the world. And, um, and, that's, uh, and I'm, I'm, that's, those are the facts. And uh, and so, like I think that's part when people see uh, that could be a part of that reason. Like America is going in the wrong direction, is that we're losing our middle class, too many middle class, uh, high paying manufacturing jobs, and uh, we don't have enough workers. Not enough workers who are, who are paying into these uh, important uh, entitlement and uh, social uh, programs. And so when you don't have the workers paying into these uh, programs, uh, those, the whole entire system becomes financially stressed. I think a lot of people agree with you, and I, I hope you're right, because I think that jobs are a unifying factor, and I think most people realize that what we need the most is a president with a good jobs plan, with a good tax plan, who's going to make it possible for hopefully, theoretically, some of these factories to come back and set up shop in the Rust Belt here in Kansas and elsewhere. So one last question that I want to get, have you answer, because I know you're very passionate about it. In the recent WikiLeaks that have come out, there have been disparaging remarks made by the Clinton campaign, internally of course, about Catholics and evangelical Christians. What are your thoughts on this as a Catholic? Well, personally, my thoughts as a Catholic are that I'm very, I'm very sad. Okay, it's 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 it's, it's tragic, and uh, also I'm very, I'm uh, I'm. It's it's outrageous and uh, and and you know e even though I'm uh, 58 years old, it, it's a little bit scary. Okay, it's a little bit scary for uh, and uh, you know for a presidential candidate to come on and, and uh, the air and face a national audience and 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 to say that uh, if she's elected president, that what the uh, evangelicals and uh, and, and Christians uh, can expect is is a, a continued assault on their religious liberty. That's that's very scary, and uh, and I, I, and as I said, my wife and I are, are very compassionate humanitarians. Um, we're not racist. Uh, we're we're actually uh, doing missionary work for a uh, children's <laughs> orphanage in Uganda uh, called the Kasizi Good Shepherd Orphanage, and. Uh, and when PBS News, our uh, news correspondent, John Yang, w was here in my house, uh, I told him, uh, you know, that we were uh, a Catholic family. And I, and I told him that, that, that we were pro-life. And, um, and I'm not going to apologize for, for being pro-life. 
and uh, not not the Hillary Clinton or anybody else. And if Hillary Clinton sh should happen to be uh, the next president of the United States, and, and I am determined to do everything possible that that does not happen because I think Donald Trump is the better candidate, then I'm still going to be pro-life after November the 8th. Well, and good for you. I think, you know, in the old days, before liberal politics took over, we used to call that having principles, and not enough people understand what it's like to have principles and stick by your principles. Well, Dan, this has been a fantastic conversation, but I want to give you the final word to our viewers. Um, I would just, uh, I would like, uh, you know, voters and, uh, and, and stuff to really give strong consideration to, uh, where we're going as a country and, uh, we're in trouble. America's in trouble. And, uh, that was one of the things that w was drawn me to Donald Trump is that we need a, a problem solver in, in the white house who has a good understanding of the issues, who knows that the middle class is in trouble, who sees our country becoming more of a consumer nation and less of a producer nation, and uh, how that looks in the uh, eyes of the world. Okay, I also think that the level of corruption uh, in Washington, D.C. has reached a point uh, where it is severely tarnishing the image of the United States. And so um, there's a lot of important issues that I think that, that we have to face now, but, but also uh, the younger generation as far as uh, what kind of government and what, what kind of future uh, do you want to have. And so I, I, I look uh, forward to uh, speaking with you uh, again, and uh, I thank you for the opportunity to uh, be on your show. And thank you for so much. Thank you so much for coming on. I'd love to have you on again, and hopefully we can get you on before. But if nothing else, we'll have you on after November so we can celebrate a very hard-fought victory together. Well, Dan, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, sir, and uh, you know, God bless, and uh, you have a, you have a blessed day. Welcome to The Honest Media. I'm Tom Papert, here with Craig Chrysler. So, if you read Politico, if you read Politico, Trump is losing Florida. If you live in Florida, there's no reason to go out and vote, right? Mm -hmm, because, yeah. because he's already lost, so why even go vote? It's totally pointless. Don't do it. Don't vote. Whatever you do, don't vote. Well, if you're listening to CNN, MSNBC, ABC, anybody, he's already lost. It's almost like they're a little bit worried, because then mm -hmm. if you go to the actual website where they talk about the voting statistics for what's going on in Florida, and you look at the vote-by-mail request and early voting statistics, it tells a different story. Mm -hmm. It says that about the same number of Democrats and Republicans have requested ballots to be sent by mail. They call it vote by mail. In a lot of other states, it's just called an absentee ballot. And, but if you look at who actually voted, check the boxes, and sent them back, 30,000 more Republicans have sent back their ballots than Democrats. Yep. And then you can say, yeah, well, if you look at the people who actually walked in and voted early, about 25,000 more Democrats voted, so okay, Trump's still ahead, 5,000, right? Yeah. And then if you go to no a party affiliation, the independent voter, who everybody is trying to court all the time, I don't understand these people, to be perfectly honest, how can mm. you be independent? Not in this election, I don't. Other elections I have, but definitely not this one. But, so, 384,000 independent people requested an early voting thing, a vote by mail ballot. 208,000 have sent them back. Now, just think about that. That's a lot of people, considering this country, a lot of people are still in the parties. It's like 30-30, 30% in Republican, 30% in the Democrats. And then you've got a big chunk, 40% independent. And independents are coming out big time. Not only are they coming out, these are people who maybe they don't always vote because they don't like either party. They're really coming out this time around. Yeah. And who, you know, if you were an independent voter, who is dissatisfied with the Republican Party. Which who, I have been forever. Who doesn't feel at home in the Democrat Party, doesn't like their policies. Never have. Maybe like some of the feels good stuff they have to say. Mm -hmm. Who are you gonna vote for in this election? Are you gonna vote for Hillary, who is the epitome of everything that independents hate, mm -hmm. or are you gonna vote for Trump? 
I don't know. I think I'd want to vote for the career criminal who's embezzled millions of dollars, sold state secrets, murdered people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That does seem like what the independent voters would go for. <laughs> so, so, so if you look at this and you're logical about it at all, you can either say what well, you can say one of two things. This indicates a tie because if you if you're not going if you're going to totally throw the independent voters out the window, mm -hmm. okay, fine, you're an idiot. Then it's about a tie. There's about a five thousand difference. Assuming everybody just votes down the ballot, Republicans vote r Trump for president and all of their local Republican representatives. Then it's about a tie. There's about a five thousand difference. But if you have a brain and you say that the independents are more than likely going to go out for Trump, in spite of whatever the crooked polls say, where they oversample people Trump is weak with and they oversample Democrats, mm -hmm. if you're smart and you say independents are going to go for Trump, then Trump could be winning by a margin of 100,000 voters for all we know. Oh, yeah. Probably more. It, it I honestly think that he'll probably get 65 to 70 percent of the entire popular vote, but we know how they have the machines rigged. I mean, it's public record on the Senate floor. Well, they, they can, can shave skew it them off. up to 20 to 30 percent. I was going to say, they can shave it off, but they yeah. can't do enough. And if you look at the rallies, everybody says, well, rally turnout isn't indicative yeah. of vote. But Tim you know Kaine's 50-person yeah. rally. 30. <laughs> 30. 30. 30 people showed up, and he fed them. He oh it was like God. a pizza party or something like that, which, by the way, creepy Kane offering kids to come over to his rally with pizza. What Imagine that guy is president. He's the weirdest guy ever, and Hillary will probably die <laughs> in the next year and a half. Or and then that guy Pope is going to be in charge. Yeah, yeah, creepy Kane. I don't want to imagine that. I don't even but know I don't what think would it's, happen. I don't think it's going to happen. I think Trump is going to win this thing. And I think oh, he's going yeah, to win it sure. by such a margin that even if they skew it, they can't get their way. You know, George Soros was on, oh, some program, Lone Star or something, something, something along those lines. We can, we can link it in the comments if anybody's interested. Or he says, I think Trump and his God, he's like, like Darth Maul, his weird accent, yeah. right? And he well, he literally he, is Darth Maul he, of he is, he, he the is, world. He is Palpatine. I mean, yeah. let's be honest uh -huh. here. Palpatine, but, yeah. And the guy is sitting here in his deep voice talking about how, well, I think Trump may win the popular vote, but the Electoral College will make sure he has no chance. And well, that's more than likely true. It's not true, though, because the Electoral College is still dependent on how the people vote. They just have to then apply mm. that. No, that's how it works. That's why California has so many electoral votes. And people say California should have more, Texas should have more, a couple other places should have less. But... Well, I know how it's supposed to work, but... But it's not... It, you when know you win in a landslide, you know when you win in a landslide, are. and it's not like Gore, where yeah. there's a couple percent, there would be riots in the street. I mean, look at this country. A guy get a, a black guy gets shot by a black cop in a city with a black sheriff, a black mayor, a black governor, and there's riots in the street. Mm -hmm. If we have confirmed proof of election fraud, it's not going to be pretty. I think people will just stay home and watch football. Football's <laughs> down this year. Football's down 20% because That's of the amazing. Kaepernick That's stuff. Amazing. People, as, as Alex Jones would say, we're breaking the conditioning. Uh -huh. And we are. People aren't buying this crap yep. anymore. They're literally tuning into Trump, his online TV show that he's doing every day now until the election's over, where he just has people from his staff interviewing members of the campaign and mm -hmm. governors who have endorsed him and politicians who have endorsed him. Gets more views than CNN during prime time Dang. on Facebook Live. <laughs> more views during, I mean, he, it's the first night, CNN the premiere night. CNN and all night. of them, MSNBC, has got such terrible ratings. They're it's horrible. A joke. They're losing money They're every day. Well, they don't care about the money. Yeah. This is what nobody understands. Everybody uh -huh. thinks they have some kind of profit incentive, and they don't. Because it's it's like, look at the New York Times. It's, it's Carlos Slim's blog. Mm -hmm. It's a Mexican billionaire who thinks he can buy American politicians. It's his blog. Mm -hmm. He owns it. He doesn't care if it loses money, he's going to use it to push Trump down. And it's the same way with all these different TV networks. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the items I have here, I didn't give you a copy because the text is really small and it's going to be hard enough for, for me to read anyway, but it was after, um, th this was sent to a guy named Bill Still, he's a YouTuber and I think he's got a TV show. And this was sent to somebody, he asked to remain anonymous from the Comcast, from a Comcast email address. Comcast, for those who don't know, owns NBC and a million other things in the world. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say it's crooked, maybe it is. But this is what was sent to him by somebody who was there at the forum, the presidential forum that they had back in September. Do you remember that, where Hillary got to go first and then Trump got to go? Mm. 
yeah. that thing. Mm -hmm. And they crucified poor Matt Lauer, who did nothing wrong. I mean, he was probably the least biased person mm -hmm. we had. I even felt like he was still being mean to Trump. But he slid in one line that Hillary didn't know about. She got the questions in advance, but he slid in one <laughs> line that, hi that Hillary didn't know about. And we got to end the segment, but I want to read some of this. She was in a full meltdown mode and none of her staff dared speak with her. She went kind of manic and didn't have any control over herself at that point. How these people wor work with this woman is amazing to me. She really didn't seem to care who heard any of it. You have to see this to believe it. She came apart, literally unglued. She is the most foul-mouthed person I've ever heard. And that voice at screech level, awful. She screamed. She'd get that Matt Lauer fired for this. Referring to Donald Trump, Clinton said, if that bastard wins, we'll all hang from nooses. Lauer is finished. And if I lose, it's all your heads for screwing this up. Jesus. This is Hillary. This She's a female Hitler. And <laughs> really, you're onto something there. But it just shows. And, and mm -hmm. then she goes on, and I'm going to talk to Comcast. I want a Comcast senior executive down here Jesus. to begin. Which just shows NBC is nothing. It's all the parent company. Uh -huh. It's all the owners. It's all the special interests. They buy the well, TV what is network. It? Almost every TV station is owned by like four companies. And it's about to be two here soon. You yeah. know, we're, we're one of the exceptions somehow. Uh -huh. I don't know how we're still alive here. But... And we got to go to break. But it just shows how these people who buy the politicians, they buy the media, they buy the newspapers, they buy it all. Mm. Nobody's buying it anymore. 6% trust in media. We can reach a million people in one week by talking to a college girl in St. Louis. We'll be right yeah. back after the break. Welcome back to The Honest Media. There's been a lot of saber rattling lately about what's going on with Russia, you know? I think Hillary Clinton really wants to go to war with Russia, which should terrify the hell out of anybody who has two molecules of brain yeah. matter Listen left in Listen to her brain. every time she talks, she's bad mouthing Russia. She really, really wants to go to war, which yeah. is just baffling. You remember that stupid reset button a few years ago? Mm -hmm. Flies halfway across the world. Reset button. The guy's face. I, I think it was Mindvedev who was who was pressing the button. He's like, I can't believe she's making me do this. Like you could just <laughs> Dude, see yeah. the hilarious. He's fighting back laughter. And and there's that great meme where it's like, L M A O. Hillary wants me to press this stupid button before she sells me the United States supply of uranium. Yeah. But uh, this is from October 25th, and it's from a Swedish, Swedish yes website called Aftenbladet, and I had to translate it, so it's a little dicey here, you know, mm -hmm. Google Translate only works so well, but Russian missile ships into the Baltic Sea can fire nuclear weapons. Oh, yeah. And it goes on to talk about how they're moving from Kaliningrad off to the Baltic Sea, mm -hmm. how they may be used in the Syrian war, how it's very strong indication of things heating up, and how they feel forced, Sweden, Sweden, forced to increase their security. And this is just the latest provocation. Yeah. This is just the latest As step. we speak, there's an entire armada of Russian ships heading towards all the U.S. and U.N. ships right around Syria. And we have shipped over 10,000 troops into uh, the name of the country escapes me, but it's, the area. it's touching it's Russia. The staging yeah. area. And this is not happening in a vacuum. This, this isn't hasn't just happened since World War II. They haven't had that kind of troop movement. Well, and this, this isn't just happening in a vacuum. You know, this is mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton, who and could, Barack could, Obama. could be the next president of mm -hmm. the United States. Hillary Clinton, who could be the next president of the United States, the largest, most powerful army in the world, and has she said. she is probably the last. Well, de no, definitely the last. Mm. Definitely the last. Mm -hmm. She will be the last president of the United States because she wants to dissolve the United States' borders. If a nation True. without borders is not a nation. But mm -hmm. she has said, I want to go to war with anybody we even think may have hacked us, okay. may have committed a cyber attack against us. So 
she said, and, and everybody in the media, everybody in the Democrats, they say 17, uh, 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 what do they call it, cybersecurity agencies, and then if you look at them, it's 17 private agencies, which the government contracts through, and if you look at who owns them, it's Hillary supporting Democrats. It's a totally phony line. Mm -hmm. Everybody's saying, Russia does everything. Russia hacked everything. Hillary Clinton in the debate made it sound like Vladimir Putin, the president mm -hmm. of Russia, is hacking her emails. Yep, right. And he on called a horse, Trump brilliant. Hacking everything. That's right, with his laptop and his gun and didn't it, and it come out that the DNC staffers leaked all them. Well, not recently? officially. We all we know it almost for sure though, because mm -hmm. when somebody said tweeted at WikiLeaks back when Assange had access to the account, it, I, they tweeted something like maybe Seth Rich is the hacker mm -hmm. is the one who leaked it. They did confirm it was a leak actually, not a hack. That's true. And then, and they and all WikiLeaks mm -hmm. tweeted back was maybe. Yeah, which makes you think, huh? The guy who was killed in a mugging, except nothing was taken, and it, we still don't know who did it. And huh. he offered a big reward huh. for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And WikiLeaks offered uh, the monetary reward. Yeah, but w as we speak right now, the entire country, is, Russia, is preparing for nuclear war. All well, they of are. citizens, they government are. officials, and they're being honest about it. They're not hiding yeah. it. Not like here, where no, oh, everything's and fine. Hillary just wants to go to war with Russia. No big deal. We're Russia sitting is sitting here, not being told anything. Russia is stockpiling here. food in mm -hmm. its largest cities, bread, so people will be able to eat for six months. Mm -hmm. Russia is telling its people it's vital, it's absolutely essential. You figure out where your nuclear fallout shelter yeah. is. We don't even have them anymore. I don't think we do. I mean, no. I, and when we did, I was talking to a to a to a, a baby boomer coworker here at the station who was telling me they sucked. It yeah. was like the basement of a high school. Uh, you know, yeah, that's what they were. There's not tons Hospitals, of food. There's, there's, yeah, like there's not a lot of food and potable mm -hmm. water there. Yeah. Just a guess. Where so they're getting ready because well, they uh, called, they called their what aren't we home. being told? They called their people home. Mm -hmm. They called the wives and children of their foreign people who are working overseas to come home. And they mm -hmm. said, do it now. If you're in the middle of a school year, drop it. Get back to Russia now. Yeah. Something big's going on. They're preparing for full-blown nuclear war. And, uh, and what Putin, we're not being told here. Putin went in a release where he's telling He's speaking to the people mm -hmm. of the United States. Guarantee you, nobody's seen this video outside of the people who really follow this stuff, mm -hmm. where he's saying, I don't know how to reach you anymore. Oh, yeah, Your I saw people that. are lying to you. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to tell you what's going on. Yeah. I mean, we are literally on the brink of a war. And just look what happened. Well, I mean, we're already at war with Russia right now. Well, it's a proxy war through Syria. It's already a hot war from what I understand. It's just... Uh, but it... Mm -hmm. I, I, I does, and then you've got Hillary, I disagree, because then you've got Hillary saying we need a no-fly zone over Syria. Well, guess who's flying jets in Syria right now? Yeah. Russia. Yeah. Right? And this is what drove mm -hmm. me crazy in the GOP primaries. Carly Fiorina, Chris Christie, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, Jeb Bush, everybody on that stage, even if they've endorsed Trump now, I will never forgive them for this. They said, they all said, we need a no-fly zone over Syria. Yeah. Trump is the only one who said that's insane. Yeah. Because in order to establish a no-fly zone, we'd have to start shooting down Russian jets. Mm -hmm. If you shoot down a Russian jet, do you think that just happens and they don't care? No. Yeah. They're going to retaliate. God knows what they do. Maybe they send a missile to go take down the people who took down the jet. Yeah. Then what happens? we got to retaliate bigger. We've got to send five missiles. Then what happens? Mm -hmm. Nuclear Armageddon is the end of this. With two nuclear powers, when you start instigating and it builds and it builds, and it builds, it doesn't end well, with a tea party. It's more than two. I heard China's sending ships now to back up Russia up there in Syria. Not only that, the Philippines just uh, basically kicked the United States out. How do you say they that guy's name? Is it is it Duart? I, I can't know, say his but name. He, but he's a wild man. He, I mean, really, he yeah. is. And and if you look at he China, went to China, when he went to China yeah. and he repudiated the United this States, this is a huge deal. This is like it the really biggest is. deal that happened really since is. World War Two. And and if but if you look at what happen when when Obama went to China mm -hmm. versus the Filipino guy the the leader of the Philippines what happened yeah uh, <laughs> Obama basically got treated like he was a nobody and that guy got the star treatment. He had to go out the yeah. service entrance, yeah. which is like short. He had to like duck his head uh -huh. and walk out. And then there's like no motorcade. Yep. There's nothing going on. There's a couple guys. They hand him a. So this ain't going to be good either. We got massive military uh, installations in the Philippines. They want us out. Uh, what's going to happen? China's going to come in and say you guys got to go. And then we don't go. So. 
I, our, stuff our right only now hope. is hotter than it's ever been, and you don't have one big station talking about but this. But you do find out all about what did Trump eat for dinner? Did he use silverware mm -hmm. with his fried chicken? What did he say to a woman on an airplane yeah. 45 years yeah. ago? These are the important stuff. Yeah. Know? Not our impending global destruction mm. with Russia. And Trump is the only guy that's saying it would probably be a good idea to be friends with Putin. Yeah. God forbid we're friends with other nuclear yeah. powers. We, and and I, I think we're going we're gonna to get killed by the traffic department if we don't end it now. So this has been The Honest Media. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. It's thehonestmedia.com to read everything you ever wanted to know about this 2016 electoral season. I'm Tom Pappert. I'm Greg Chrysler. We'll be back next week as we get ready for the big day, November 8th.